Welcome to GSAP, everyone. Thank you for coming and welcome to this year's Bayard Memorial Lecture. I am Jorge Otero Pilos and I'm director of the Historic Preservation Program. Um, care is at the heart of preservation. This ethic of care is one of preservation's most important contributions to all the other disciplines in the built environment. Now, of course, architecture, planning, real estate, care about the built environment as well. The difference is in the limits that each discipline imposes on itself in its thinking about care. These limits are not just academic, they're also legal. For example, architecture's professional definition of the standard of care is inwardly focused. It's limited to the services provided and to the work done within the property lines of the client's lot. By contrast, care in preservation is outwardly focused and much more expansive. Care for us is not a standard, but a generative ethic that begins with acknowledging the world as it is, a world that has been here before we arrived on the scene, a world that has historical depth, a world where old things carry meaning, even as they change outward appearance. Few things have changed so much in outward appearance as the land and the sky where we are gathering tonight. This land was forested and populated by the Lenape peoples before it was cleared, carved into plots, sold, and built up. The sky was only clouds and stars before it was saturated with pollution, airplanes, and carved up into satellite orbits. Despite these changes, the land and the sky that remain still allow me to acknowledge that we are gathered here in the Lenape Hoking, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples. And so I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community their traditional territory, their elders, their ancestors, and more importantly, their future generations. And in acknowledging together with our whole school, together with GSAP, that Columbia University was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. Now, to acknowledge the land, and I always insist also the sky, is to accept their historical existence and the people that shaped them over time. To acknowledge is to begin to care. It's to start on the path that goes from recognizing the value and relevance of the past in shaping our understanding of the present towards making sure those things are not destroyed and lost forever. Caring as practice in preservation is a sociopolitical act of defiance against social, economic, erasures and exclusions, against violence and against ignorance. This is especially relevant for us tonight because we're about to listen to Professor Sarah Bronin, a preservationist whose career embodies the highest commitment to caring for the existing world. She's a leader among a generation of preservationists and scholars, including our very own Professor Erica Avrami, with whom she has collaborated and with whom she will be having a discussion after her talk, who together have taught us to acknowledge the existing built environment also as a social environment. There's a new preservation crystallizing around this ethic of care, around their work, that sees every act of material preservation as a sociopolitical act. In this new preservation is a challenge to all the professions of the built environment to expand their standards of care beyond their internal professional standards, to draw outside the lines, quite literally, to draw outside the architect's property lines, to draw outside the planner's zoning and red lines and to draw outside the developer's bottom lines. Professor Bronin is an expert at drawing outside the lines. She, like many of the most exciting and experimental preservationists out there, 
has never stayed in one lane. She was trained as an architect at UT Austin and as a lawyer at Yale and brings all that formal training to her practice as a preservationist. She's written books and treatises on land and on historic preservation law, on renewable energy, on climate change, on housing, on urban planning, on transportation, on real estate development, and even federalism. Her forthcoming book, The Key to the City, explores how zoning rules rule our lives. She advises the National Trust for Historic Preservation and Sustainable Development Code. She serves on the Board of Latinos and Heritage Conservation and leads Desegregate Connecticut. Previously, she led the award-winning unanimously adopted overhaul of the Zoning Code and City Plan of Hartford, Connecticut, and spearheaded the city's first climate action plan. So no one was surprised when the Biden administration recently nominated her to chair the US Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Well, who else, of course? We're honored that she has accepted to deliver this year's Bayard Memorial Lecture. Professor Bayard was much beloved director of Columbia's Historic Preservation Program. And like Professor Bronin, he was an architect and a lawyer who argued fiercely for the importance of old buildings in contemporary life. We're honored to have Rosalie Bayard on our call uh, through Zoom or through our live stream tonight, as well as Sam White and Ray Devell, his partners in the office of Platt Bayard Devell White. We're thankful for their support of this lecture over the last 13 years. So without further adieu, Please join me in welcoming Professor Sarah Broman. First, I should thank you all for being here today. I understand it's one of the very first lectures um, uh, in the post-pandemic era or whatever we are in right now. So thank you so much for being here. Um, thanks to Dean Wu for the invitation. Thank you to uh, Dr. Otero Bailos uh, for that lovely introduction, uh, Professor Rami for taking the time to comment, and uh, all of the supporting staff members uh, who made this lecture possible. And I'm also very honored uh, to know that uh, some of uh, Professor Bayar's friends and family are joining us today virtually. So let me begin with this, um, these words. There is, in a sense, no such thing as preservation. Every act of preservation is inescapably an act of renewal by the light of a later time. A set of decisions both about what we think something was and what we want it to be and to say about ourselves today. The value of preservation is only partly in the accuracy and the breadth of its understanding of the past. Its value in the end is the presentation the old and the new make together about continuity and difference. The value of the combined work increases the richer and brighter the light of its novelty. So those were the words of Paul Bayard, the lecture after whom, uh, the person after whom this lecture was made. They're in the afterword of his book, The Architecture of Editions, Design, and regulation. And even though they're in the afterword, uh, I think they were central to the book and indeed his whole worldview about the primary purpose of preservation. As it turns out, his views and mine are very similar. Uh, more on that in a moment. So you've heard a little bit about me and I think I would call myself a preservationist. Um, I think so anyway, I've written books and articles about preservation, I teach a preservation law class, I've been involved at the state and local and uh, national levels on that front. I will say uh, Latinos and Heritage Conservation is a great organization. If you haven't heard about them, go find them online. I've also rehabbed my brownstone, uh, 1865 Civil War era brownstone in downtown Hartford. I'm taking it from a rather neglected state 
I'm the only project where I've been architect of record. My desk overlooks uh, the sign of the Charter Oak in the country's oldest public park, Bushnell Park. So I just say all of that to emphasize that I am a committed preservationist, one who really has been devoted to the protection of historic places. And yet the title of my talk is, Can Preservation Law Evolve in Its Second Century? And I guess you might be asking whether this is an instance of, I love you, you're perfect, now change. And I have to admit, yes, it is. Today, you'll hear me talk about four pairs of concepts, two reasons why I chose this topic, two predominant bodies of historic preservation law, two later innovations in historic preservation law, and two external changes that will force preservation law to evolve whether we preservationists are ready or not. So my first pair of concepts, why I chose this topic? I chose this topic for two reasons. First, because preservation law dictates outcomes in the preservation movement. Nearly every aspect of preservation practice is regulated. Nearly every choice that we make as a society about what to preserve and how to preserve it, what not to preserve, is enshrined by law, enshrined in law. Nearly every value, monetary or otherwise, that we can measure in historic places is manipulated by law. So there is no escaping that law is central to historic preservation, its modern practice, and its future evolution. Paul Bayard recognized this, and again, I will quote from him. The public worth of what architecture does is recognized in laws expressing public interests in how buildings function, setting and enforcing standards for safety and similar matters. The public worth of what architecture says is also recognized by law, most importantly, by laws expressing public interests in historic preservation. So that's the first reason I wanted to talk about this today. The, the second reason uh, I wanted to ask this question of you all is because I don't think enough of us are engaged in serious consideration about what historic preservation law does and what it's for. You're actually really lucky you have faculty members here who are leading this conversation, not just in your classrooms, but nationally. But this room of thinkers is the exception and not the rule. Understanding the nature of the preservation law canon is really important because only with understanding the law can we understand how we should critique it and what we need to do to change it. I should say too, as I will at the end of the talk, that I think we're up against something really important. These two external forces that I'll mention that are really coming at us from outside the field that will require us uh, to change. And they'll do that again, whether we're ready or not. And so my question for preservationists is, do we want to yield the field to others because we refuse to lead? So with that question in mind this evening, I want to take you uh, through the arc of preservation law, going back to its uh, inception, what I would say is about a century ago. And I do, with some uh, care and caution, uh, want to critique the troubling inflexibility uh, in our current laws and what I consider to be a lack of imagination about preservation law's future. So I really hope that this talk compels us to deepen and accelerate the conversations uh, that we need to have about where we're going. So with that, uh, first, to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm going to condense a century's worth of preservation law into just about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, and here I'll discuss that second pair of concepts, outlining two bodies of preservation law that have emerged over the last century. I say a century, and I think that's right. Um, uh, there were previous laws passed by Congress to address specific sites. Uh, one example of that is in 1893, Congress passed a law um, that uh, was used to, uh, 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 that was uh, uh, authorized the use of eminent domain and appropriated money for the uh, acquisition of the Gettysburg battlefield, which you see here. Um, that act was challenged uh, in court uh, 
Um, it's actually the first case that we have in our preservation law casebook, an 1896 case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. It actually uh, sanctioned Congress's use of eminent domain, recognizing preservation as a public purpose. Uh, I will also admit that before 1922, our century marker, Congress passed the first federal preservation law that was not site specific. That law, the Antiquities Act of 1906, allowed presidents to create national monuments motivated by then President uh, Theodore Roosevelt's love of natural uh, plate of nature. Presidents used their antiquities powers uh, 42 times before 1922, again, our century marker. The scope of those powers is still being debated today with the most recent legal disputes about President Trump's attempts to shrink monuments created by prior presidents. Putting that act aside, we started to really see preservation law take off, uh, not at the federal level, but at the local level. And it happened starting in the 1930s, just a few years after the rise of local zoning laws. In 1931, Charleston uh, became the first city to adopt historic district regulation, followed shortly by New Orleans uh, and then San Antonio, and soon many more places. Since the steady pace of adopting local historic preservation ordinances has continued, and about one in 10 local governments nationally have adopted historic preservation laws. Um, I actually have been in, involved in a project where we've counted all of these uh, jurisdictions, which uh, there was no uh, modern count before. So that's a sneak peek number from a paper um, that will be essentially a census of historic places and a, trying to figure out why some states, why some places adopt regulations and don't. But that aside, essentially these regulations at the local level were the same as they were 100 years ago. A local body reviews proposals to see whether they're compatible with the existing historic fabric. And this is what Bayar meant about preservation laws governing what architecture says. By and large, these local codes are pretty similar to each other. Uh, surprisingly similar. In fact, state enabling acts across all the 50 states that emerged since the 1930s, actual, actually after local governments did it first, are also very, very similar. That might be because of a 1978 Supreme Court case. Again, we see the Supreme Court weighing in on preservation. It sanctioned a particular local law and actually the New York City Landmarks Law where we, we sit here today. 1965, it was passed. Many preservation veterans in this room know about this case, Penn Central Transportation Company versus City of New York and involved Grand Central Terminal. Um, I won't go too far into the details except to say that it was a very high profile debate about whether local governments could engage in the kind of historic preservation regulations they'd been engaged in since the 1930s. It was so high profile that Jackie Kennedy uh, got involved in, in this discussion and many say shaped public opinion about it. Um, by the way, if you don't have this book and you have children or you know children, uh, it's one that I really love. The Supreme Court said the New York City landmarks law was A-OK -okay, and you know that because you know it still exists today. And if it was good enough for the Supreme Court, it turned out to be good enough for lots of other local governments around the country. So again, uh, you see, uh, while local preservation laws outside of New York are not as detailed as what you have here, um, the gist of it is the same. And you see, again, this sense of copying uh, from one jurisdiction to another. I should say that at the local level, there have been a few innovations. Portland's deconstruction ordinance, San Francisco and San Antonio's legacy business program, the smattering of conservation districts in Dallas and other places, including village districts in Connecticut. Um, but beyond that, uh, preservationists seem to stick with the status quo. And I think we should admit that we've probably lacked uh, some imagination, at, at least at the local level. So now I wanna talk about the second wave of preservation laws. And that is the group of federal statutes that passed in the 1960s. The most important of these was the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. This law was motivated by the demolition of Penn Station uh, just a few years earlier, along with the destruction of urban renewal and a growing interest in protecting historic places on the national scale, not just at the local level as had been done in the preceding decades. 
So with the National Historic Preservation Act, Congress requires federal agencies to consider historic places when they are conducting certain actions known as undertakings. Federal agencies also have to ascertain whether there are historic resources, as historic resources within the areas of potential effects. Four years later, Congress also passed the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, which took a similar approach. And around the same time, Section 4F of the, of, of the National uh, Department of Transportation Act of 1966 uh, went farther and actually required federal agencies to provide more substantive protection for historic places when it came to their transportation projects. So in other words, it was that particular law was more than merely procedural. As for these laws, I would have to say that they've been working pretty well. Through process, they have protected many different places, including and especially tribal resources and archeological resources that might've otherwise been destroyed. It's a role that the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation plays is to help assist federal agencies with navigating their section 106 duties um, and I should add here, uh, you know, in light of a pending uh, confirmation, that Congress gave the Advisory Council a really narrow role in all of these uh, different statutes. So it doesn't encompass local laws or most of what I'm talking about today. So that disclaimer aside, you now know the two big bodies of historic preservation law, local historic district laws, which emerged in the 1930s, and federal preservation statutes, which emerged in the 1960s. And so since these two major bodies of law, is it really true that there has been no innovation whatsoever in historic preservation law? And I would say not, maybe not, turning to our third pair of concepts, I wanna mention a couple of federal statutes that Congress uh, enacted since the 1970s, which changed the game a bit and helped us think about preservation in a different way. So the first is the federal rehabilitation tax credit which was enacted in roughly the form uh, that we know it today in 1986 with various tweaks and modifications ever since. I see some folks who, say, who are saying, yes, I, I know what that is. Um, many preservationists work in, uh, in the field on preservation projects uh, and tax credit projects, whether through the regulation side, maybe working with developers or uh, with community groups trying to make them happen. Um, and if you know the uh, federal law, you know that lots of states have copied it and modeled their own state laws after uh, the federal act. So for those who don't know, uh, the way that this tax credit works, somebody wants to rehabilitate a building that's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. They make a proposal to the National Park Service, which oversees applications, and the Park Service decides which projects are eligible for a tax credit. The number one uh, thing that the Park Service uses to evaluate whether a project will receive investment or not is whether the project complies with the Secretary's standards uh, on rehabilitation. So hold that thought. Um, we'll talk more about those in a minute. Um, but just to say here that the standards are very broad. Um, they are pretty short. Um, and sometimes when they're applied, uh, we probably need more clarification. Again, I will talk more about that in a moment and you'll see some images of tax credit projects. But for now, I wanna mention a second legal innovation and that is uh, again, um, one that came from Congress. This one came outside of preservation but has significantly changed preservation practice and it's the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Here, preservationists had long known because you can see with your own eyes um, when, when historic sites are not accessible to people with disabilities. Access to historic places is not just a matter of convenience. It's a moral issue and one that preservationists who are well-trained in finding compatible solutions are well positioned to solve. But rather than finding ways to address accessibility, say for example, establishing norms and preservation practice or being very active in fundraising specifically for accessibility upgrades, we waited as preservationists. Federal guidance for the ADA today does address public historic places. It allows them to sidestep full compliance if there's no way to achieve physical accessibility without threatening or destroying historic fabric. When the ADA does apply to historic places, it has successfully challenged architects to do better during historic building rehabilitations. 
Here's an image that we include in our casebook too. Uh, it is the addition of an entrance at the historic DC uh, Court of Appeals. There's a ramp and uh, entrance uh, upgrades and other ADA compliance uh, 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 additions here. And what it gave to people accessing this building was access to justice, perhaps the most important kind of access. The addition is clearly new. It doesn't detract from the old, it enhances it. That's something that Bayard hopes or would have hoped would have happened here. With the ADA, you perhaps surprisingly see the ethic of historic preservation, one of mediating between values being enshrined in law. Just like Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act balances federal agencies' actions with the protection of historic properties, the ADA balances the right to access against the desire to keep essential elements of historic places intact. So those are two changes to preservation practice made through law. The first changed incentives for preservation and private attitudes and behavior too. Unlocking uh, since its enactment over $100 billion plus of rehabilitation investment. The second affected the design of historic places where the important value of accessibility needed to be addressed. In both situations, values were resolved and weighed and resolved in law. These two laws prove that evolution is possible, even if it only happens once a decade, and even in the case of the ADA, if it results in part from preservationist inaction. Okay, so so far, I've painted a picture for you of a body of law that has developed in a very stable and some might say path-dependent manner. So we're now at my final pair of ideas. I wanna tell you that I think that there are two sets of external forces that are battering down our door, um, forces that will compel preservationists and preservation law to change. The first force is a physical one, and that is climate change or if you're out there listening and you're in a place that doesn't like to say climate change, uh, you can talk about resilience, the ability to withstand and recover from shocks or really use any other word. It doesn't really matter what you call it. It's happening. We will not be able to save what we value if our laws don't change to protect our places. At a minimum, we have to allow sites to be protected and we also have to enable people to reduce the environmental impacts of historic places. And here's where the secretary standards come back in. Again, these are federal guidelines for the treatment of historic properties, for additions, uh, at rehabilitations, changes to exteriors, and so on. This is what they look like for the rehabilitation treatment, one of four specific treatment types that are covered in the standards. They're just a few sentences. Um, they talk very generally about what people can do with their properties when they're making changes to it. And they may be few, but they're very powerful. They dictate almost anything people can do when they touch historic properties. They're important because they are used to secure historic rehab tax credits. They are incorporated into easements. They have been adopted by state legislatures and local historic district commissions all over the country. And so for that reason, what the standards say and how they are interpreted really has ripple effects at many different levels of preservation practice. So I've published a couple of critiques of the standards and how they are sometimes interpreted to thwart our climate response. They don't expressly address climate change by their terms. They're too short to do that perhaps. They've been interpreted to deny the installation of energy efficient windows and solar panels. They don't seem to anticipate the need to raise buildings and sites or move them. There are also sustainability guidelines. These are from 2017 from the National Park Service, as well as flood guidelines, 2019. Uh, they were first drafted at the illustrated version just came out last year. Uh, again, issued by the National Park Service. These are pretty conservative um, documents in general. They, they adhere pretty closely to the existing standards. 
Um, and as you note from this slide, they only address one kind of hazard. They predominantly address the flood hazard and not all of the many other types of hazards, um, wildfires, extreme heat and drought um, uh, that, that uh, we see happening all over the country. They also, I've said in other places, may not be flexible to address modern challenges uh, more generally. As Professor Avrami has pointed out, historic buildings aren't always the greenest buildings. And so with that in mind, I'll use an example from uh, Hartford, uh, where I live, on the energy efficiency front. So this is the Swift factory, an 1887 deteriorating gold leaf factory uh, in a predominantly black neighborhood in Hartford. The only feasible way to rehabilitate it was through the federal rehabilitation tax credit, which meant that the secretary standards that I just mentioned would be applied to the renovation. The existing walls uh, in the building were uh, very thin brick walls, just two to four widths wide without a cavity. When the developer wanted to use insulation, not, not spray insulation, but removable insulation on the interior walls, um, they were denied. When they wanted to build uh, precast concrete sills uh, to accommodate a thermal break, that too was denied. The project was built anyway, and you can see here there is no insulation in that space. I bet it's pretty cold there today through the winter. I bet the nonprofit developers uh, who invested in this project are putting more money to energy bills uh, than they wish, money that could have gone to community programs. In a paper where I talk about these issues, I also cover the Colt factory in Hartford and their saga with denials uh, of installing energy efficient windows. I also cover issues at the Hotel Marcel in New Haven, a Marcel Breuer building reimagined by Bruce Becker to be the first net zero hotel in the country. I should say here that I don't blame the State Historic Preservation Office or the National Park Service reviewers. The rules aren't clear. The thumb isn't on the scales of energy efficiency uh, specifically or sustainability in general. And actually in other ways, our SHPO has been quite progressive. Here's our SHPO speaking at a historic and green conference that I convened just before the pandemic. The SHPO has approved uh, solar panels at uh, the Preservation Connecticut's headquarters, uh, the Preservation Connecticut being the statewide nonprofit. The headquarters uh, are the Eli Whitney boarding house, clearly a very historic building. They were also behind a project, I think the first in the country to map coastal historic resources against climate change projections. This is what Mystic may look like in just a couple of decades if average sea level predictions, uh, sea level rise predictions hold, and those are historic sites. They found actually that 32,000 historic sites in Connecticut would be uh, subject to sea level rise, um, uh, would be at risk of, of, of being submerged by the sea uh, by 2050. But this work uh, runs against the tide, so to speak, if we don't help by addressing the secretary's standards, because there's no way that Mystic can address the issues that it faces um, without uh, better guidance. So in a chapter I published in Professor Avrami's recent volume called Adapting National Preservation Standards to Climate Change, I suggest two new treatments, relocation, which would allow for and even promote managed retreat. The second, deconstruction might be added as a treatment, uh, as a last resort type of treatment. I also suggest there that existing standards be revised to incorporate uh, both climate adaptation. So in other words, techniques and materials that can help our buildings adapt and respond to changes in our climate, as well as climate mitigation, techniques and materials that prevent the harmful effects of climate change. New provisions that expressly re support renewable energy across all project types should be considered and adopted and chemical treatments that protect historic places against smoke and mold risks should be more freely permitted. Insulation and energy efficiency should be prioritized and not rejected. In other words, the thumb must be on the scale of changes that support our ability to address climate change. What James Marston Fitch, distinguished Columbia affiliate as well, called preserving the prototype should no longer be our primary goal. We're also going to have to change the way we approach disaster laws. I would say that preservationists have not inserted themselves into conversations about planning for natural hazards 
or about how historic materials will be treated in recovery. We haven't been loud enough in pushing for large scale data collection that would show us all the risks of natural hazards uh, with against where our historic places are. I've written another paper about this called Laws Disaster, Heritage at Risk. And if you're interested in these issues, I encourage you to check it out. So in sum, it's a false idea that preservation and sustainability are incompatible, that we should not fortify, raise, or move structures because the standards prevent it, that solar panels, when uh, roof-mounted wind turbines, and other removable amenities will destroy our aesthetics. If an inflexible approach to preservation results in the disinvestment in and destruction of historic places, we will be blamed and we will deserve it. So I'll conclude that comment, commentary on sustainability by just saying preservation is about change. And yet as the world around us changes, we have not pushed our laws to respond from within. The second force that will change the way we've been doing things is problematic in a different way. And that is the way that a few are undermining the movement as a whole, particularly in the realm of public opinion. And again, I say this from a place of love and as a committed preservationist. So you may have seen, if you follow this, commentators in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and most recently, the Atlantic have excoriated preservationists for their inflexibility. One much discussed example was the denial in DC of historic panels on a house. Another example down in lower Manhattan right here where we are today was the use of preservation to delay and shrink affordable housing construction in a massive parking lot. In fact, it is the debate with housing where we are losing, not only in public relations, but morally. We are in a national housing crisis, a structural shortage whose tragic consequences are playing out in community after community all over the country. And yet we have seen some instances where historic designation and preservation um, principles are used to block conversions and additions that are actually complementary to and compatible with historic fabric. So we as a movement have to think bigger and do better and try to help those among us who don't see uh, avenues for compatibility. And for three organizations that have done that, I wanted to give applause here uh, to uh, my friends in Connecticut, Preservation Connecticut, Preservation Action and the Connecticut Main Street Center which have all joined a coalition, I guess I started somehow called Desegregate Connecticut. It was formed in June, 2020, originally motivated primarily to advance the equity cause of housing justice. It has expanded to include 80 coalition members of which those three organizations uh, count themselves, as well as dozens of team members, mostly young people who have been working diligently on uh, the movement on the research, advocacy, and education sides. Our research diving deeply into zoning codes all around Connecticut uh, includes the zoning atlas, which revealed shockingly to me, a person who studies zoning, that 91% of Connecticut was zoned for single family housing, while only 2% was allowed, uh, allows for multifamily housing as of right. Meanwhile, 80% of our state has one acre minimum lot requirements, which essentially forces us to build only sprawl outside of our communities or cities and towns. To their credit, our three preservation groups realized that this was actually bad for preservation. Infill development is needed to support small businesses and small town main streets. Conversions can help rehab historic places and housing density is actually historical. Supporting smaller lot sizes, minimum parking reform and transit oriented zoning also positions preservationists as pro-environment. They help stop us from sprawling outward, pushing us to concentrate development where we've already built. 
So in Connecticut, our statewide proposals, we were lucky. Um, our grassroots organizing model allowed for um, some statewide zoning changes last year. This year, we're going to the legislature for lot size reform and transit oriented community zoning, uh, both uh, of which would affect historic places. I do wish uh, that um, as the zoning discussion statewide is underway here in New York, that you have similar voices um, to uh, that parallel ours. Um, zoning proposals, unfortunately, seem to be drawing opposition from preservation groups. This is from an email this morning. So preservationists can lead locally too, not just on the statewide level. In Hartford, when I was on the Planning and Zoning Commission, we made all housing as of right, multifamily housing included, by setting out clear rules for compatible development in our many historic neighborhoods. We also have guidelines on solar energy that allow for, again, mostly as of right development. This is actually part of a statewide approach that puts solar panels first, puts the thumb on the scales. Our state law says historic commissions can't deny applications for solar unless there are serious consequences to historic fabric. So as preservationists, I do think we need to start taking from within a pro-housing stance. I think we need to take a pro-climate response stance. And we need to actively and on a national scale support solutions, not just show up at meetings and throw up roadblocks. I have to believe that there are more people who support this kind of evolution within our movement than do not. So I will just repeat here that preservation is really about change. And as the world around us changes, we need to push our laws to respond. So just to conclude, this is a scholarly talk for scholarly audiences. And I should just reiterate that I haven't said anything here that I haven't said before or written about um, before. Um, I did think about uh, showing you what you might have seen in prior Bayard lectures, stunning projects and glossy images, which inspired me certainly as I watched them on your YouTube channel. But I think what you most needed to hear today is that unless each one of us in this room, each one of us watching, lawyers and non-lawyers, deepen our understanding about what preservation law is, uh, how it impacts the places we care about. Uh, unless we get into the weeds and the words, preservation as we know it will become increasingly untenable and out of touch as a field. It really is better for us as preservationists to lead in mediating between old aspirations and new realities, between underprotection on the one hand and overprotection on the other between our clinging to accuracy and our need to allow for difference, richness and brightness, between our passion for the prototype and our urgent need to protect what we can while we still can. It is really better for us as preservationists to assess our values and to renew our movement, to welcome new people to it and to let them shape our direction. So I will leave you again with the words of Bayar. There is, in a sense, no such thing as preservation. Every act of preservation is inescapably an act of renewal by the light of a later time, a set of decisions, both about what we think something was and what we want it to be and to say about ourselves today. So thanks again for letting me speak with you. Thanks for inviting me here today. And I hope to see you again by the light of a later time. So thank you so much for um, not only a thought provoking talk, but um, I think an affirming one for many of us in the field who are not willing to yield. Um, I stand in solidarity with you on that, as you know, um, and as most of my students know for sure, as well as my, my colleagues. Um, and so I appreciate you really you know, laying that out so clearly, the role of law. And in particular, I was struck by your comment that um, that value is manipulated by law, that that in setting up um, these policy structures and the institutions that support them, we establish um, norms 
standards like the Secretary of Interior standards that fundamentally um, you know, frame and in some ways curtail our ability to be future thinking and forward looking. Um, so I'd like to really dive into a, you know, your, your different areas a little bit. And the first one, um, really thinking about that dialectic between the local and the federal. Um, by establishing those norms, um, like the Secretary of the Interior Standards, by setting up things like the certified local governments where the federal government provides funding to local governments who frame their ordinances in compliance with um, things like uh, the criteria for the National Register, as well as the standards. Um, so the copying that you refer to between municipalities is also reinforced between the federal and the local. And I'm, I'm wondering whether you'd comment on that and talk a little bit about how you see disrupting that, you know, that field of reinforcement, whether it's lateral or between levels of government. Yeah, so for those not familiar with Professor Avrami's work, she's actually gone out and documented all of uh, the local governments and to what extent their codes are homogenous. So I certainly rely on, on her research um, to uh, make these claims uh, in the talk and in my own work about how there is a lot of copying between, uh, between jurisdictions. As she says, this is institutionalized. It is something that's reinforced by the federal standards, certified local government um, compliance uh, being uh, one uh, way that that happens. So a lot of times what happens is at the local level, there is simply an overall reference to let's say the secretary standards. Um, so if the secretary standards change, that reference would then refer to updated uh, standards. So in that sense, if it's a very minimal reference in local laws, that's a good thing because it would allow for uh, changes to be uh, then trickled back down to the local level as if and as changes happen uh, with the standards. Um, other times they take the standards and they take them word for word and then put them in um, into local laws. Um, and that obviously presents more of a challenge in terms of updating. Uh, the ideal thing would be that first part of the certification program becomes institutionalized that if the secretary standards change at a certain point within two, three, five years, the local government's laws would have to be updated if they were to the contrary, if they were the second kind of laws. So I think there is a way to institutionalize the updates. Um, it's not something that, um, uh, it would be something that the National Park Service, if they ever did update the secretary standards would have to think about and um, think carefully about because local governments have so many different ways of doing things. So um, let's talk about significance and integrity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because uh, so much of why we designate something gets tied to that idea of material integrity um, and that significance is, can't necessarily be divorced from the formal dimensions of places. Um, and so how do we, how do we reconsider the ways in which those fundamental criteria, again, which underpin the National Register and oftentimes get repeated in, in local ordinances, how do we reconsider them in a way that allows the kinds of change that may be required in the face of the climate crisis to um, be understood as you know, acceptable without kind of damaging the material integrity, because that's the argument we usually hear. There's so much against the material integrity. Yes, I mean, so um, uh, Professor Abrami is referring to standards for the National Register of Historic Places, which are very similar at the state and local levels, and they typically revolve around two concepts. Is the site significant? Does it have um, a, a significant event or person associated with it? Is it a significant architectural style um, or is it, is it important to prehistory or history? Those are typically the four um, paths to significance. Paired with that is this question of integrity. So before a resource is listed, it has to be shown to have integrity, which is the abil its ability to communicate its own significance. I didn't talk about the National Register standards in my talk, 
but they're hugely important um, in the three federal statutes that I mentioned, all of which tie their protections to only properties on or eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, and they're hugely important for state and local designations as well. And so your question about how do we, um, how do we change them? How should we change them? I mean, the, the standards have been challenged, uh, the, the uh, standards for designation, the National Register standards have been challenged, not just um, on um, elitist grounds, but also on grounds of exclusion and discussion about how underrepresented communities may not be able to satisfy through their cherished sites uh, the kinds of material standards um, that uh, sometimes are read into the National Register criteria. I mean, there's not an easy answer to this one. Maybe that's why I avoided it in my talk. Um, but, but the, I mean, but but in reality, there there are a lot of different models as to how other countries look at the designation process. So looking at um, different different levels of designation, um, something we uh, haven't really considered here in this country, um, which may allow for different standards uh, to be applied in different situations. Um, there's also a discussion happening about um, how tribal resources may need a different type of standard, um, especially those uh, that rely on traditional knowledge um, for proof of significance, um, proof that cannot be provided necessarily uh, to uh, the uh, American government um, in the form that it is frequently sought because of current National Register criteria. So I think that's an ongoing discussion. I think for me that the, a clear, the clear set of solutions emerges um, when you think about the standards, uh, secretary standards for the treatment of historic properties. It's a little less clear about what is the best approach um, to the um, National Register criteria. Now on the advisory council, that's completely, you know, there's no, there's no authority over any of those things. So any anything that I, I would say here or you know, even in that role would just be, you know, just that advisory. But I think that if you put enough preservationists in a room, um, you know, hopefully they can come together with a solution. And that's what I hope to see. Um, so I'm gonna push that a little further and talk about energy reform. And you raised the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, which is uh, a, a fascinating instance whereby law really did impose upon preservationists the need for change. Right? And as I, I know that you know, there were in several legal challenges by preservation organizations to, um, to the law and having to comply with the law. Um, and so it is... Uh, an instance where we can look back and say, well, we may not have been on the side of justice on that one, right? We were not thinking about questions of access um, and questions of exclusion uh, and because we were so concerned with material forms. And so it presents a really interesting case whereby, um, you know, the law resolved it for us, whether we liked it or not. And now we've moved um, toward a practice and set of policies that more readily embraces the need to make these kinds of changes to historic properties. So I'm curious when it comes to questions of energy, and that can be from installing solar panels onto historic properties, or the fact that across the United States, at least at the state level, historic buildings are exempted from energy code compliance. Um, and so we have long histories of not having to retrofit buildings for energy code compliance. So do you see the law stepping in and compelling change on that one? Or do you see a way in which the institutional infrastructure of preservation can mobilize change itself? So the... Um... The kinds of laws that impact how much energy buildings use and how much energy we use to create them um, are, you really find that those uh, the levers of power in building codes um, and um, maybe even housing codes, which have maintenance requirements. Uh, you know, the, uh, the truth is, is that preservationists don't seem to be all that 
involved in the process of developing those codes. They're typically developed through the International Code Council, which has a suite of dozens of different kinds of codes, including a, um, existing buildings code and separate energy code and um, all kinds of um, other, of course, the standard building code and all kinds of other specialty subcodes. Um, I don't know that preservationists are very involved in that. And I think as you, um, I think your your research uh, suggests, they, they probably would most want or advocate for exemptions to these codes. Um, I think it's really important um, for us as preservationists to not, uh, to almost like the, the ADA, which has, um, it, which in its application, it really widely varies, but um, where historic buildings are exempt from uh, many ADA com compliance requirements. You know, sometimes you ask, well, why? Um, and that's a similar question I think you can ask on the energy code side. Why are all historic buildings um, exempt? Of course, it's more costly. It adds to renovation costs, but over the course of time, many of those costs can be recouped by the building owners or the building users. So um, in, in many cases, the upfront investments in, in energy um, uh, ma materials, techniques, or uh, the arrangements that result in more efficient buildings uh, pay off over time. So, I, I mean, I guess my hope is that um, we come to some growing consensus within our community that it's time for us to be subjected to some of those things and, and make it um, a balance, of course, um, but that um, something that I think we're not engaged in right now much, unless you've seen more than I have. <laughs> uh, we're working on it, right? Um, so with that idea of investment, oftentimes we as preservationists think about investment on a a building by building basis, right? Even we apply for the tax credits, you know, based on a project. Um, and I know that the work that you've done uh, through Desegregate um, Connecticut is thinking at a much larger scale, right? Thinking about this not only as larger geographies, but as, as you know, more diverse publics, right? And what does that mean when we think about reinvestment in, in a community, revitalization in a community um, that gets beyond the building? Um, and so I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, that notion, how tax credits might play a role in that or might be considered um, differently. Because right now, the way in which, as you, you know, so aptly illustrated, um, that process of review going through the SHPO and the National Park Service, they are mandated to only think about the form, right? They're mandated to only think about um, what's happening to the building, what gets preserved, its integrity, its significance. They have no mandate to think about impacts on populations. They have no mandate to consider less energy consumption and um, or economic vitality, for example. And so how might you see those kinds of processes, whether it's tax credits or other um, policy tools, enabling preservationists to kind of move beyond the governance model that so focuses on the building? You know, that's a really interesting question. And when you were talking about um, the, the, the individual building approach of the tax credits, it made me think, well, why can't communities go in with a whole streetscape approach or a, um, a community amenity neighborhood approach um, and really ask for investments on all of it? Um, you know, maybe that's a, a new innovation um, that should be considered and um, added to how we think about the tax credit program. Uh, nationally, the National Main Street Center has been um, involved in lots of projects that have added up individual buildings for tax credit pro projects on a main street or in a community, um, and they've kind of done the individual by individual model to add up to more than a whole, um, but that doesn't address really your, your questions about um, the community benefits that preservation projects might provide. And, and how you measure those. And, and I guess I would say right now, I don't know that we have good tools to measure the kinds of impacts that even an individual project might have um, or the ripple effects of a preservation project, whether it might lead to um, uh, gentrification or exclusion, whether an individual project might 
have long-term negative effects on the community or, or many long-term positive effects. It's hard to know. We do right now only have the tools to measure um, what we put into a building and how many jobs are created in that building, construction jobs and jobs in the building, residents, uh, residences that are created. Um, so it would be a different way of thinking about the benefits of preservation, one that, you know, you know the scholars who have um, looked at the economic benefits of preservation, um, there have been studies about that, but I don't know that they've been um, thought about uh, in a tax in the tax credit context. So that's interesting too. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the segregate connected um, because you were very effective at building a coalition that expanded well beyond preservationists, but also bringing preservationists into that mix, the preservation organizations in Connecticut. Um, who, as you noted, sort of bought into the idea of densifying, right? Um, and density and preservation are not always um, happy bedfellows, as we know. So uh, could you talk a little bit about how um, mutual trust, mutual respect was built amongst the varying um, coalition members, uh, how preservation kind of saw itself in relationship to this broader uh, raft of, of agencies, not-for-profits, et cetera, um, and how you see that as a potential model for similar types of coalition building in other contexts. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that everybody has an interest in creating more housing opportunities for everybody because it benefits all of us when all of us can have access to homes. Um, and so I think if you buy into that simple concept, um, it's, and, and if you just keep saying those same words over and over again, it's kind of hard to develop good arguments against that. So I think one way to start attracting people to coalitions like ours in other states is just to say, this benefits all of us. This benefits environmentalists, it benefits preservationists, it benefits developers, it benefits people, families who cannot find housing now, who are doubled up, who are paying too much of their income, who can't afford uh, the things that they that they can afford. I, I think if you look at our coalition, it's actually started off with professional groups, the American Association of Architects, Connecticut chapter, the American Planning Association, Connecticut chapter, um, uh, the um, uh, affordable housing groups as well. We have several um, statewide and local groups. Um, uh, social justice organizations and environmental groups. And what we tried to do was build consensus on a series of reforms that would meet intersectional goals. So we're not saying free for all housing everywhere and all we're doing is just allowing, we all we want, you know, we're not advocating for just again, free for all permitting everywhere. Our suggestions are very tailored to where existing development exists, to where existing infrastructure exists, uh, to build on what we have already created. And that should have appeal to um, lots of different groups. Um, and preservationists, again, fortunately saw that as appealing. Now, again, we're, as, in terms of our current proposals, we're not saying uh, everywhere in Connecticut should be full of Manhattan style skyscrapers, despite what opponents sometimes suggest our proposals are, are promoting. We are suggesting you know, middle density within towns, um, at places where there is existing sewer and water infrastructure allowing for um, eight units per acre, which in New York is like a luxury beyond luxury, right? I mean, eight units per acre is, but in Connecticut, it's sort of baby steps. And I think that's where you, you, you actually, and maybe this is the way that you know, law professors mind works is that you start with what the words on the page are. You start with what the policy is. And if you can get enough people to agree on the policies that you're promoting, then they will continue to build. And we've been really fortunate um, with our movement that it has only continued to grow. Um, we recently, actually, our two latest members are the uh, Connecticut Citizens Climate Lobby and the Greater New Haven Arts Council, because they thought our artists need housing too. Where are they going to find housing? We're in this with you. And actually, we're going to help jazz up your materials a bit. Um, so there's a there's a win-win there. So I, I think it's just the, the trust building is we're going to develop a policy together. We're going to go in together and it's going to make, we're going to make sure that it meets everybody's goals. 
and we'll make incremental progress. We're not going to turn Connecticut into Manhattan, but we need to start thinking differently about where we're placing housing, which again, the central premise of what we're talking about is that everybody needs this, even if you're, um, you know, from everybody, from somebody who's searching for housing to somebody who has a magnificent house um, somewhere in uh, somewhere in Connecticut, we all benefit. Um, before I open up uh, to questions from the floor, um, I want to pose one more to you since our audience is largely comprised of students, um, preservation students, law students, others. Um, as you think about the future of the field, as you think about what's needed to not yield the field, um, what do you see as being important for future generations of preservationists to be thinking about? Um, so I, I think that you should, uh, as future preservationists, you should show up to meetings with existing preservationists because you are not in those rooms. I can guarantee it. You are not. You are not in those rooms. I mean, maybe you, maybe you guys probably attend some of these meetings, but you should be in all of the rooms. Ask nonprofit organizations who are advocating for preservation whether you can go to their meetings, whether you can sign up for a committee whether you can write something in the newsletter. If you don't break into the rooms where you're not already invited explicitly, um, the preservation movement will be slower to change. One of the reasons that I showed you the slide of our team for Desegregate Connecticut was because you could probably see that I was probably the oldest person on the slide um, and that it was largely young people. Right now on our team, we have young people from um, universities, uh, they're from Connecticut, but they, they're going to Harvard and Michigan and um, Yale and School of Architecture and uh, UConn and, and Eastern Connecticut State University and high schools in Connecticut and, 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 and. And so our team is really driven by and powered by young people. And the reason that's important is because if you look at the composition of zoning commissions around Connecticut, around the country, they are not young people. And by encouraging that army of young people to get engaged in zoning, like who thinks about zoning? But they're all there chatting about zoning. In fact, they're meeting tonight. Our team meeting is tonight. Um, they're right now chatting about the best strategies to do this and that um, in the state. And they're strategizing, they're leading. And they all came to us just by contacting us. And we said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll have something for you to do, no problem. And um, that's how open I think the preservation, existing preservationists should be to you. And if they're not, then you, know, you should try to, try to get involved um, wherever you can because they need you. We need you, preservationists need you. On the land use side, if you're on the zoning side, zoning commissions need you. And slowly we can build up the change that's needed to rethink the way that we do things. And I don't, again, I never ascribe bad motives to people. Um, and, and the status quo. The status quo is the status quo. Laws are hard to change. It's a hassle. You have to notice them. You have to draft them. You have to, it's like a big hassle to change laws. So they just kind of sit around there. And I don't think it's, again, not, maybe not malicious. It's just, we haven't thought about them. And so your job as young people is to go out and make room for yourself in this field and to help people think about what we can all do to try to make things better. Thank you. Um, questions? I think in light of your discussion about housing shortage as being a crisis and, and sort of that middle density as being a goal of sorts, um, it's sort of paradoxical with historic preservation sort of being like, do you keep some neighborhood that's already sort of inefficient in that metric? I'm curious to know like your take on how what shape that will take in the future and maybe as an example like certain districts that might be sort of inherently inefficient um trying to throw that word in there in that context so are you asking um are you asking about uh why choose middle density as a goal or or are you or given that um i i'm an architecture student so i'm interested in sort of the for, the formal aspects of of that sort of future and um, if you could say something about what you see going forward. I mean, if, if you know, you, the, the first part of your question was, if there is a crisis, 
um, shouldn't we be building astronomically large uh, amounts of housing everywhere, maybe, um, and the scale of middle housing potentially being more compatible with historic places, but maybe not satisfying the needs of the housing crisis? Um, is that kind of where? So, uh, I mean, for us, our strategy is we have to start somewhere. Um, and if you look, I mean, if you go, so I have, if you're an architecture student, you, you might like this other paper I wrote called Zoning by a Thousand Cuts. These are all pretty downloadable online, but it, it talks about all of the, not just those three stats that I showed you in the zoning atlas, but a hundred pages worth of the download of what we collected in the zoning atlas, including all kinds of minimum parking requirements, height caps, lot coverage requirements, um, uh, uh, minimum unit sizes, minimum lot sizes, of course, and how all of these combine together to really stifle housing. And so it was almost, it, after we collected all of this information and the level of districts across the, the state, it was almost overwhelming to think about where to start because all of these little cuts do constrain housing in different ways. And they don't necessarily even have the goals that they're intended to have. So this idea that minimum, that we, we hear a lot actually in, in light of our minimum lot size reform proposal, that minimum lot sizes of an acre or more are good for the environment. It's like, no, actually that's not, they're really bad for the environment because they create sprawl, they encourage more driving, they use land, they make us turn forests into lawns that were pesticides. It's like the, the opposite. Um, and so there, it's very hard to know where to start. And so that's where we started in Connecticut, that's where they started in Oregon uh, when they started zoning reform uh, many years ago. Vermont is doing similar. So it's kind of an incremental process, but um, we sort of took it as uh, you, know, you, you have to start somewhere, and, that, and that's kind of where we where we started. Thank you. Behind you. Um, I wanted to ask about, uh, as you mentioned, New York has Hochul's budget has a bunch of. Um, zoning related reforms that I'm very excited about. Obviously, California last year passed a number of bills. How should we as preservationists think about other areas where that kind of state level action isn't happening and areas where perhaps at the municipal level, preservation feels weaker than it should be? I'm thinking of Philadelphia, for example, where the preservationists have kind of battled to um, maintain some of the housing stock that does not have kind of the same, like there's not the same shortage as in parts of California or New York. So is this um, a movement, which I'm very excited about, like this is why I'm here. Um, is this something that like is gonna be in California, Massachusetts, Connecticut and New York. And then, you know, at some point the crisis will get bad enough that it moves to the state level at Pennsylvania. Or is there a way to kind of make a national movement, even though I think like preservationists are dealing with different things in different places with regards to the housing shortage and affordability crisis. Okay, so there's a lot of questions in there and I'm super excited that you're super excited. Um, but um, so maybe I'll, I'll start with this. So last week um, I published an op-ed in Bloomberg City Lab called Why We Need a National Zoning Atlas. And I actually think, so there's people in Philadelphia who may be working on it. Um, I actually met on Tuesday with some folks. Wednesday, Wednesday? It was yesterday. Okay, yesterday with um, some leaders out in Long Island who are considering not only investing in something like a zoning atlas, but also investing in a housing movement like the one that we have in Connecticut. And they wanted to know kind of how we started. So I think that there are good discussions um, in, in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania generally about these issues. Um, but I think in order for people to really understand why they need to engage, they need to be able to measure it, which is why I'm a big fan of um, developing zoning atlas type projects where you can see very clearly um, how Long Island, um, uh, uh, Philadelphia and the suburbs around it zone. And then you can see just right off the bat, wow, that's a really big problem. It's impossible to read a zoning code if you're a non-architect, non-lawyer, it's impossible. So what we did through our research was in 180 zoning jurisdictions across Connecticut, we read 32,000 pages of zoning text. We coded 2,600 zoning districts and we you know, did, did um, 90 different characteristics of the zoning districts, only about 25 of which appear in the zoning atlas. But I just kind of throw out all those numbers to say, if you document it, you can just make endless arguments. Like these thousand cuts, there's just like, there's just endless things that we could do to make things better. And, but you, you kind of have to document it first. 
that has helped to catalyze more advocates to what we've been doing. And so I would say that you as somebody who might be able to sift your way through a zoning code much better than, than others and who have friends who do GIS, if you don't do it yourself, you know, I, I put up a methodology too, um, and that's been used. I'm using it in my Cornell class. They're using it in Minnesota, Chicago, other classes to start mapping out zoning atlases in those communities. So I think one key is, you know, you're smart because you're here. You know, you, you yourself personally could start this kind of discussion, this kind of thing from a preservation land use perspective and, and create that nexus. I mean, I would love to see you all band together and create young preservationists for New York or something and start to say, just put out press releases. I mean, that's kind of how we started. And I had a meeting and then people said, we'll join the coalition. I said, what coalition are you talking about? I mean, this is really just like me in the pandemic sitting at my computer saying, does somebody want to meet with me about this? And then it just sort of exploded and all this. So you personally can do that. I delegate to you the authority to create this movement because if you don't, Who's going to do it? No one. I mean, you know, that, that's the thing about these conversations is that if you don't start the conversations, you have a lot more power than you think. And I can tell you, you are going to be more organized online than many groups that are anti-housing. <laughs> Everyone should join Open New York. In New York City. <laughs> but yes, and, and Open New York is, do, is doing a lot of advocacy as well, but they're not doing it from the preservation angle. So the, the, and again, the politics around these questions are really interesting because, you know, sometimes people think if you're pro homes, you're anti preservation or you're anti this or, or what, but, but that's one of the reasons why you, you know, the, the special group that you will start um, can help to complement what Open New York is doing. One more, maybe. Yeah. Hi, Professor Browning. Thank you for your lecture. I just wonder, um, what do you imagine as the new policy making forms to enable preservationists we to steer the changes to historic built environment? Because one of the takeaways from lecture for me is um, our role today is not only to fight against the changes, but to steer, to regulate these new changes brought by flood ad adaptation, brought by um, energy retrofitting. So I wonder um, what do we need on the front of policymaking? Do we need a rev revised um, state level, local level law? Do we need new design like guidelines? Do we need a revised um, review process or something else? Thank you. Yeah, so I think any of those state, local, or national uh, levels can provide guidance for specific issues. So, um, for example, Colorado deals with wildfires. Maybe that's where uh, the uh, protocols on landscape, changes to historic landscapes that allow for wildfire breaks occurs. And maybe it sort of organically drifts up from communities that are addressing specific hazards. I mean, I don't have a, a prescription as to where exactly at what level um, or what they will say, but I do know that um, without having those conversations and setting out goals, it took many years to, to just do the flood guidelines at the national level. So do we want to start at the state level? Somebody you know, needs to get things moving. And, and I think that there are discussions happening now in a number of states and local governments too. And I should say local governments um, have been um, uh, so I mentioned a few innovations in local government when I ticked off the deconstruction ordinance and so on. But local governments have also tried to address um, sea, sea level rise in particular. So Annapolis is one place that has um, some has done some thinking about that. St. Augustine, Florida, um, Newport, Rhode Island. So there are some local communities that are thinking about these issues. Um, whether they've entirely resolved them is another question, but um, but they're out there and they're actually all talking to each other too. So there is some hope. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time, for traveling the distance to be with us, and especially for being in person. So 